All right, so we are going to talk about robots, but first we're going to do something a little bit fun, uh, hopefully. So who here remembers Taco Copter? <laughs> okay, a few people, apparently not, not that many. Um, but the problem with Taco Copter, right, is that it doesn't exist. It's, it's <laughs> just a dream until today, which uh, Christian Sands from uh, Skycatch is going to show us, right? I okay, think it's already it's, flying. Are we getting video? Oh, no, oh, oh, here it comes. God, I'm slightly terrified. <laughs> I think that's worth some applause. <clears throat> now, that we, nice. now that the tough part is out of the way, you must feel a little relieved. Um, I think, uh, what, so what we're going to talk about <laughs> are not the, if everyone probably has an idea in their head about a robot from science fiction like C-3PO, the Jetsons made something like that. That is not what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about robots who don't look like your traditional robots that might even be a <clears throat> thermostat, but actually are doing, you know, at least these guys are going to make the case that they're actually doing a lot of interesting work with robotics. But maybe we'll just start with those science fictional robots and have each of you tell us your favorite robot, starting with Rob. Yeah, my, my favorite robot is Kit, the Knight Industries 2000 from Knight Rider. Uh, or Daniel Oliva from uh, Foundation Series by Isaac Asimov. Oh, I'm going to applaud that. Well done. <laughs> Mine is C3PO. <laughs> I got to go with Wally. Such good personality. <laughs> So Rob, you actually helped us uh, develop the idea for this panel, um, and I think you know it gave us some ideas for ways to think about robotics that aren't you know what we would normally think about. What do you think on, on the other side is sort of the boundary between you know what makes a robot a robot versus some other kind of hardware? Yeah. So as you mentioned, a lot of people think of robotics as almost humanoid robots that can move around. Uh, the definition that I think of and, and we think of at, at Shasta is something that can sense your surroundings, it learns from the information that it gets in, and then it acts. But the device can be absolutely anything. So think of almost like an enchanted object, and that's what I think of as a robot. An enchanted object. An enchanted object. I, I was not assuming that's a good answer. Um, OK, so I think with that definition in mind, I think we're going to ask the other three guys to convince us that what they're working on mm. is a robot, or at least robot, has robot-like qualities. I think this will be easier for some than others. Uh, maybe we'll start with Boris. Yeah. So like, uh, um, like Rob said, robotics is about making physical things come to life and using software to define them uh, to do very fascinating things the way you would expect on the software side. And, uh, for us, um, we're starting with entertainment. It's a fantastic place to start, and we are making physical characters understand their surroundings. Uh, they, uh, they react to each other, they understand what they're doing, they have a personality, and they come to life to make experiences possible in the physical world that had never been possible before. And with Anki Drive, that's our first incarnation of this technology uh, in, uh, uh, in people's living rooms. Okay, Christian? Uh, for us, it's, uh, it's a little bit different because we have a, a different type of challenge, which is gravity, right? So we're, we build UAVs and make them as close as possible to a helicopter with a pilot in it, but without the human in it. So a lot of, a lot of the work that we put in is software to make these guys really smart to sense and avoid, go to certain locations, do things, come back completely autonomously. All right, Matt. So when you're going to build a device that's intelligent, where does that intelligence come from? And for us, that comes from a deep understanding of machine learning. So from the beginning of, of Nest, we knew we had to build a, a, basically a robot, uh, a machine that would learn from you and mm -hmm. that would adapt to its environment. So we actually built a team like we would have done in a robotics company. We actually hired a lot of our old colleagues from Carnegie Mellon, one of them being my professor. Like we hired a robotics team to build a thermostat because we knew that intelligence had to have been kind of in the DNA of the company. And so, Matt, when you were you know, recruiting people and you said, and there were these guys who were experts in, in robotics, was it a hard sell to get them to work on a thermostat? It actually was a really easy sell. So once you hear the idea, like do a thermostat, first you think I'm nuts. <laughs> and, and then after we start talking about it and you realize how big the problem is, everyone has one, every single home has, has one, never been replaced in 20 years, uh, they're wasting energy, horrible design issues, no usability it becomes a pretty obvious problem. And for roboticists, there's the added challenge of sensors, human, uh, human occupancy patterns, uh, environment changes. It's really hard problems. Mm -hmm. 
So you, you, I assume you have mul one or multiple Nest uh, thermometers at home? I, I do, I have one, one in Nest in my house. What, I mean, just to sort of boil down kind of what the value proposition is, how would you say you know, having that at home has, has changed your home life? So, so for me, uh, I don't need to worry about what my home is doing when I'm away. So when I leave, uh, I'm, I'm confident that the temperature is going to turn down. It's not going to run my AC all day. So if I go out uh, for a business trip or I'm at the office, it turns down automatically. Uh, fortunately, in California, the weather is really mild. But for the rest of the country, that is an enormous problem. They waste a ton of energy that way. Mm -hmm. um, Christian, so let's talk a little bit about drones. Uh, do you feel did you feel pretty confident when, when it started coming over that everything was going to go smoothly? Absolutely, yeah, 100%. <laughs> well, um, I was a little nervous. There's a lot of people here, so, yeah. That would have been really awkward. <laughs> so can you maybe tell us a little bit about, I, I mean, you, you talked a little bit about what Skycatch is doing, yeah. but maybe talk about how Sky, what Skycatch is doing is different from other drone companies. Absolutely. Um, so. We're very different in the sense that we focus on working with really large companies and scaling their UAV implementations. Rather than having someone just with the remote control and a location gathering information, we can deploy hundreds of thousands of these units, extracting information and sending it into a single location. And we use it all using very high tech technology for keeping a drone in the air on an ongoing basis. And you're mostly um, building this for industrial use? That's correct. Um, we're focusing on companies that are in the areas of construction, mining, agriculture, logistics, like UPS, FedEx, all those companies, and energy, like wind turbines, solar panels. Um, that's ba basically the range that we work with. Mm -hmm. so, so let me ask you maybe a, a slightly tougher question that, that wasn't in the prepared statement, but somebody tweeted at me, uh, and I'd be interested in getting other people's take on this too, is, if, as, you, as these you know, move into an industrial context, do you think that they're going to put people out of work? I think it's going, it's, I think, personally, I think it's going to augment our ability to have, make better decisions. Not necessarily replace people, but for instance, we did a test up in Napa Valley with UC Davis, and we had a farmer there, and he was very skeptical about this. And in fact, he was like, I'm not going to use this. I can walk the farms myself. And when he finally got him to test it out, he got some goggles on, his reaction was like a, almost like a little kid. He was like, oh my God, I can see everything. We, we saw everything, but we, we don't know anything about farming. You know, he knew everything about farming. He was able to make decisions right away. Mm -hmm. So do you think that's gonna be sort of universally true or it's gonna be like exactly how it fits into the existing workforce is gonna change depending on the industry? Yeah, I mean, this is a whole new data set. We never had this data set before. Just like before, we never had Google Maps. This is like a, one of our guys, Will, Will Pryor, from one of our team members says, this is Google Maps, but in real time and more high def. You know, imagine being able to actually have visibility on everything that you do in logistical areas like construction, for management, security, for fulfilling uh, resources when you run out of sand or panels. You're able to you know, move really quickly without having to call people. Um, you know, using, using the phone or calling people or just finding out maybe they're busy, you can act to it really quickly. Mm -hmm. What about you, Boris? So I imagine the initial Anki Drive product is not uh, competitive with human labor or uh, maybe <laughs> parenting. Um, no. But um, I know that there's sort of a bigger vision, which, which we can talk about in a second. But I'm curious, do you think that there, there's a potential sort of competition in terms of, from a labor perspective? Yeah, well, a lot of robotics is actually additive. It's not that somebody was, uh, uh, you know, People have been playing with toys and games forever. It's just that now we're making the first video game in the real world. That's something that doesn't replace somebody. It just makes your experiences better. And so a lot of technology is not necessarily a one-to-one -one replacement of, of humans. It just makes an over, the overall efficiency much, much higher. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, I mean, you, again, you, you talked a little bit about the technology already. But um, you, know, so you, you were on stage at, at yeah. Apple's uh, last, last big event, um, WWDC. And uh, how many people saw that? the cool race cars, again, a oh. few. Um, but it, it looks, you know, I think for, at first it just was like, oh, these guys are like, you know, race cars, whatever. I think there's a little bit more going on behind the scenes. Can you tell us a little bit about what was actually happening? Absolutely. So for us, right now is the uh, tip of the iceberg in consumer robotics. Robotics is a, uh, has been around for several decades, but it's always been focused on uh, agriculture, industrial, defense space. This is the first time when people can actually start expecting these technologies to come into their lives and have a really big impact. And so. We are making uh, uh, all of our robots, they're engineered to think. And what I mean by that is they truly understand where they are, they understand their environment, they, uh, um, they have a personality, they, 
behave in a way you would not expect a physical character to behave. And so with Anki Drive, that was, um, in some sense, uh, our Trojan horse in introducing people to, uh, to these types of technologies and what they should expect from physical things. But the approaches carry over to almost every aspect of your daily life. Mm -hmm. uh, so are you building self-driving cars eventually? <laughs> It's, uh, well, the funny thing is, is that, uh, um, well, we, we do have self-driving cars. They're just in, uh, in your living room. Uh, but uh, you know, a lot of the, uh, the sort of projects that we think of as the holy grail of robotics, the autonomous vehicle, the humanoid robot, um, you know, that's, a, that's like a you know, 15, 10, 15, 20-year goal. And we're approaching it from the bottoms up, where you make the most amazing application of robotics and AI that you can make today, and you use that as a stepping stone to do more and more advanced things that get you to those uh, goals down the road. Mm -hmm. One of the things you also mentioned was sort of giving you know, each of these uh, devices a personality. Can you talk a little bit about what kind of personality they have and how you give it to them? Sure. So in the, uh, uh, in the context of Anki Drive that you saw on stage, um, each of those cars has uh, a role. One of them was uh, aggressive. It was trying to get through. It was trying to get ahead. And so it behaved in the way you would expect that character to behave. And that's something that you take for granted in a video game. But when you see it physically happening in front of you and something that shouldn't have that sort of intelligence, it's really surprising. Another character might be more sneaky, more defensive. Um, another one might just be, uh, 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 might just be, um, you know, trying to uh, avoid the skirmish entirely and be like, you know, very, very uh, pacifist. And so all of this becomes uh, gives us the ability to literally program these personalities the same way you would do so with a video game character on the virtual side, except it's with a physical object in front of you. So let's step back for a second from the specific companies. Um, Rob, you know, you've invested in Nest and uh, some other companies that, that could be considered robotics companies. Could you maybe talk about what you think sort of connects them and what you're looking for in an investment? Yeah, so one of the things that we look at is where there's uh, something new that's happening or has happened in the technology that enables uh, a new set of capabilities. And often that's, that follows Moore's law, could be uh, more horsepower in the CPU, uh, could be uh, just more and more wireless connectivity, et cetera. Um, but most importantly, we look for things that can get better with time. So when you look at Nest or you look at Anki, in fact, you look at all three of these companies, they push out software upgrades to their hardware regularly. So what ends up happening is really um, just like a baseball glove that we all had that actually got better the longer you have it, uh, the longer you have a Nest device, the longer you have an Anki car, because of these updates and because of the machine learning, the device gets better with time. And that's a new relationship for people to have with these things. And that's something that we look for when we think about robotics-related companies. Mm -hmm. So what does that do for ideas, like the idea of planned obsolescence? Like, am I going to have a Nest and I just never have to replace it? Uh, well, one of the things that happens, and, and this could be a Nest, it could be Anki, it could be Sonos. <laughs> you take a look at the speakers that are in your house. What ends up happening is, instead of going to a given customer and saying they're going to become a repeat customer, you start to think of customers as people that are advocates for your product. So for the first time in history, you start to have hardware and robotics companies where products become high, they get higher net promoter scores with time. So that means that the longer somebody has a Nest thermostat or the longer that somebody has a drone, the more they like it and the more likely they are to advocate to their friends and colleagues that they purchase something. Matt, is that how you, how you guys uh, edit it? It's exactly how we think about it. So That's we, good since he invested, you guys are on the indeed. same page. We're on the same page, yes. <laughs> so we think about our relationship with our customer in terms of a very long-term relationship. So one, we deliver software updates for free. And that's, that's an unknown thing for thermostats. And one, I think we're the first thermostat ever to get like, on the internet to get updated to begin with. Uh, the way we think about things is the product should get better with time. You should love it more and more as time goes on. And you should tell your friends about it because it's so awesome. And that propels us forward. Like as a small company, as a growing company, that's the most valuable thing is that word of mouth. Uh, I don't really worry about planned obsolescence. I mean, as a growing company, we should also have new products and new services to get people to buy new cool things that they didn't have before. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, another thing I wanted to, to go back to, you, know, you guys were talking a little bit about being um, you know, coming from an academic background um, in robotics. Uh, and Boris, uh, one of the things we talked about before was, was sort of the challenges of going from uh, a university setting to actually a for-profit company. I mean, can you talk a little bit about what, uh, how, what you've learned doing that? Uh, well, when you're in a university setting, it's uh, totally OK to use a half a million dollar robot with $80,000 sensors and uh, eight quad-core CPUs in the back to navigate very, very intelligently. Um, when you want to make a 
uh, a product in consumer robotics that, uh, that people can afford and uh, use, you have to be very, very clever on how you use uh, the most, uh, how you use very clever combinations of components, uh, uh, sensors, computation, and do things uh, at a much lower price point than anything that would be possible uh, otherwise. Mm -hmm. Matt, is that something you've struggled with too? Oh man, so we, yeah. had, we had to fit some like seven sensors, two wireless radios in a package that's like this big. Yeah. Uh, and it has to be able to run for years uh, and not require external power. And that's not something that you have to do in research. And research, like the constraints are off. Yeah. Your goal is to publish, right? All about performance. <laughs> yeah, like, this is very much the opposite. Like yeah. heavily constrained, ship it. Mm -hmm. And so, and then you also mentioned, you know, hiring a bunch of, you know, academic people with an academic background to work. Was, did you have to sort of like kind of, like, yell at them for a while to get them to get that? <laughs> so a little bit. So, so the, the way we structured Nest actually is we have kind of our technology research team, which Yoki runs, and she works with an engineering team that implements those cool ideas. So they come up with these MATLAB models and all all these crazy algorithms, and then we have guys who know how to ship it, ship it. Mm -hmm. We had to yell at ourselves even to uh, get out of, our, out of the mindset of you know, what we're used to in, uh, in graduate school. It's a very, very different problem, but it's one of the exciting aspects because like, the roots are actually the same. The algorithms that we're using are ones that may only made sense in an academic setting years in years ago, but now they're actually finding a really great place in consumer products. It's the same thing with UAVs, actually. Um, a lot of the YouTube videos that you see, TED videos, you see a lot of these autonomous drones flying together and doing different figure aids and things like that. A lot of that, the infrastructure to do that is hundreds of thousands of dollars. You know, Viacom cameras everywhere. You can't really replicate that into a commercial world. So our challenge is not using all those Viacom cameras and actually be completely autonomous and then stuffing all that software into a small little uh, board. So it becomes a lot more challenging. Have you guys succeeded in, in doing that, or is that still the, a little, little ways off? We've been, yeah, we've succeeded at doing a lot of the computer vision algorithms to keep the drone completely autonomous. I mean, you saw it, I, you know, I haven't made it public yet, but you saw it completely autonomous, you know, following a laser, for instance. Right, right, and just to be clear, what, I, you know, what we saw was this was piloted, this was more just kind of a fun thing, not necessarily exactly a, a right. demo of the technology, but the goal is to make it autonomous. That's exactly right. So the one, when, like, for instance, we have an experiment at the office of a drone following a laser, um, finding a beacon, and utilizing computer vision within the board to actually guide itself without having any aid from the outside. And that's really challenging. Computer vision guy trying to you know, further refine the algorithm so it's not using too much RAM. It's really, you know, embedded system guy fighting with the computer vision guy, it's just, it's really challenging. Mm -hmm. So Rob, maybe we can talk about the, that same issue from the uh, from the investor perspective, and you know, to what extent, when when someone first comes in to pitch you, you're thinking about sort of their their cost structure. Well, one of the things that we can find pretty quickly when somebody comes in is not just the cost structure, but how much do they love the product, and how much do they understand their customer. And typically, for a customer, they want something that's inexpensive and reliable. So we, we take a look and we try to figure out pretty quickly, is this somebody who understands their customer? I know that's kind of not directly to the question you're mm -hmm. asking, but that's the first thing that we think about. Right. And then is, is cost one of the second or third? Or oh, things? it's critical. That's yeah. the tipping point for all this. Because if, if for a consumer application, we look at enterprise robotics applications as well, but for a consumer application, it means that you need to get down to a landed cost or a bill of materials. It's down around thirty or forty dollars for a lot of the breakthrough applications. Mm -hmm. Maybe higher if it's higher value add, but we're talking about something that's very, very inexpensive. And right now, you mentioned enterprise and consumer. Are you sort of looking at them equally, or emphasizing one over the other? Well, we look at them both. So if you think about some of the things that are going on in and around drones right now, a lot of those applications may be around monitoring, could be around applying fertilizer, could be around surveillance those can support higher price points, significantly higher price points. Mm -hmm. um, so Matt, one other thing I wanted to talk about was um, stuff breaking. And you know, I think people see Nest as sort of symbolic of this sort of broader movement towards the smart home, but like you can sort of have these you know, nightmares about everything starting to malfunction and like nothing in your house. Suddenly your house is like betraying you. Um, how do you think about that? Yeah, so we actually we put a lot of thought into this as well. So especially when you deal with automation, and we talk about it in the context of robotics, Nest will do a lot of things for you. But we also have to keep you in control. And that's actually one of the things that we've built in kind of from the beginning, is if we're gonna do things like automated demand response in peak, peak energy times, the user has to still be in control. And we always have to give that control to them and be really transparent about it. 
And I think one of the things that's very counter to how machine learning usually works is we have to be transparent. We have to show how the machine is learning from you and why. Right. So general, more, maybe a more generalizable way of looking that, at that is that these devices have to have sort of a, a way where you can sort of basically turn off the automation. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, Christian, what, how do you look at that in the, uh, in the drone space and in the industrial uh, space? Do you have, have you had like crashes and stuff? Yeah, I mean, um, you have to think that you, once you're up in the air, you, something goes wrong, you just go down, right? So uh, redundancy is one of the things that we're tackling right now, like having multiple drivers for the, for the motors. So if one goes down, we, take, we got the other one waiting for it. Uh, but it just gets a lot more complex when you're up in the air and you have gravity pushing you down and then you, all sorts of different conditions uh, it makes it a lot more difficult, yeah. Mm -hmm. so. What about you, Boris? If, I, I, know, I mean, how did, how did you deal with uh, sort of struggling with, I mean, just the, you know, being on stage at Apple? <laughs> uh, I mean, it was, uh, uh, I mean, that was an honor. It was an amazing experience. And, uh, uh, you know, for us, um, like it's, uh, yeah, that was, a, that was a, our first kind of coming out party where, you know, we've been working on this for over five years. But, you know, I think we have a lot of the same challenges that, um, that these guys have where uh, we're, Fundamentally, we, we, we sell hardware that is very much defined by the software that runs on it, but you have to define it in a way that is very robust, it's capable, and it'll give you all the capabilities you need for a long time so that then you have ultimate flexibility on the software side to really uh, expand the experience over time and keep it very enjoyable, very entertaining, and very interesting so that the hardware never becomes the bottleneck. And a lot of that goes into the original design. And so uh, being able to do that up front when you can't predict all the things you want to do in software, that becomes one of the most interesting challenges in the whole process. So maybe this is kind of related to, to things breaking and failure. But Christian, I know you're also doing some work around standards around drones. Yes. Um, and um, what, can you maybe tell us, uh, what do you think is going to be the biggest issue in terms of like society, think, like if there are suddenly all these things in the air? Well, we believe that all of this infrastructure needs to be regulated. Um, but no one really has stepped forward and built something or put something into place to allow us to regulate. And that's why we have, I'm working with aircodeofethics.org, uh, which is an organization that uh, basically strives at, you know, separating the, the drone uh, companies that are actually doing things for good and the people that are actually doing things for bad. Uh, and then we're also working with airhighway.org. Uh, these guys are basically building a, the blueprints of what an inner city highway would look like and having drones delivering things, dropping pickups, stations, how to, how to use that also to uh, lift up the economy in the city, you know, with registration, tall, tall uh, pricing, and all of that. So you talk about using drones for good and for bad. I mean, can you talk a little bit about like, you know, where, where you see the dividing line? And also, as a technology provider, you know, how much control you're even going to have over that? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with the technology, the infrastructure we put into place. And obviously, our interest in being involved with air highways is for, is for us to be the ones who uh, put, put the technology in place for them as well. Um, and that has to do with transponders. Everything, every time something goes up, we know about it, right? So if something is up and no one knows about it, it gets shut down some, somehow, a radio wave that basically makes it go to a different direction. You know, these are all things that you can do at some point, but the infrastructure needs to be in place. Mm -hmm. So I think we're, we're basically running out of time, but like sort of one last lightning round question, which we'll start with Rob, which is that, you know, 10 years from now, what is one thing that humans do that will be done primarily by robots? Self-driving cars. Mm. Uh, take care of their home. Uh, installing thermometers with, <laughs> with drones. <laughs> Thermostats. All aspects of entertainment, I think, are going to have much higher level of intelligence than they have today. Cool. Well, yeah. thanks, guys, for joining us. Thanks. Yeah.